What's up, kid folk? Welcome to the number one college football show. I am your host, RJ Young. Thank you for watching on the Fox Sports app, YouTube, or listening wherever you get your podcast. Today, we have a very special episode with Maryland head coach Mike Loxley, who is going to walk us through how he created the National Coalition for Minority Football Coaches, what that's about, and why it's important. Full disclaimer, uh, disclosure here, excuse me, and a disclaimer. I am a member of of the coalition and i think it is really worthwhile we also get into the future of college football as coach loxley has an idea about 25 million dollars per big 10 school i would be curious to hear what you think about his proposal to perhaps pay players in the future and just what it means to have josh gaddis and kevin sumlin on his staff in the spring and how he plans to get those guys to help him elevate Maryland to a place where perhaps they can compete with Ohio State and Michigan. Before we get to Coach Loxley, though, I do want to say I'm grateful to all of you for watching and listening, downloading our very special episode with Brent Venables, which is, I'm pleased to say, the most watched episode on the channel all year and the most commented episode on the channel all year. I'm sure that it's one of our better downloaded episodes on the channel on the podcast all year, 2023, and we ain't even wearing our flu games just yet. We're also going to touch on what happened last Saturday in some spring games, particularly Oklahoma and Colorado. But I do want to divert your attention back to Coach Loxley. And, well, they got a spring game coming up this Saturday where you can see what it looks like for the Maryland Terrapins and whether or not you think they're going to be ready for the fall. Let's go talk to Coach Loxley. I'm pleased to be joined by Maryland Terrapins head coach, Mike Loxley. Coach, how you doing? What's going on, RJ? How are you, buddy? I'm good, sir. I really do appreciate you taking the time here because there's a lot of ground that I want to cover with you, starting with just how you feel about this spring and how you guys are coming along. Yeah, I've been really pleased. I actually just finished our second of uh, three total scrimmages when you include the the red and white games coming up here on uh, April 29th. And uh, really like the way we progressed from the first scrimmage to the one we just had Saturday. I thought it was a lot cleaner, uh, not a lot of penalties. Uh, a lot of young players got some opportunities to, to, to go in the shell and, and really perform. And I, I was, I really liked the way we came out of Saturday's scrimmage and looking forward to building on it the next couple of practices here before we have our red and white game Saturday. Developing players, developing coaches, this is my transition, Coach, to one of my favorite topics surrounding you, which is the National Coalition of Minority Football Coaches and how that came together. First, though, I need to tell you, I'm a member. Okay. I signed up. I'm a part of it. I want to be a part of it. It is really important to me, and we'll talk about why. But some of the guys that you have working with you include Miami Dolphins GM Chris Greer, Ozzie Newsome, my goodness, Nick Saban, Mike Tomlin, Bill Polian, Willie Jeffries. Goodness, the first black FBS coach in history. And then, of course, Buddy Pugh, who also gave Deion Sanders the business in the Celebration Bowl. But we will get to that a little bit later. Coach, how did this come around and how did you come around to finding it? You know, what, RJ, it, it was simple. Um, I thought there was a space that was needed. You know, I came into this profession in 1992 and you saw people like John Thompson and Nolan Richardson and, and, and those guys really. Um, help shape to make the game better for minority coaches and uh, coming in through the BCA, the Black Coaches Association, as it was known, uh, joining in 1992. And then when I looked up during the pandemic, when we finally, you know, it was the first time in my career where everything paused. There was nothing, uh, no team to coach, no spring ball to get re ready for. Uh, and it gave me a chance to do some self-reflection and quality control as to where I was in my career. And probably the biggest takeaway was that, um, you know, there wasn't a space or an advocacy group out there like we had when I first got into this profession that could help uh, football coaches, minority football coaches, uh, take the necessary steps to be in the position that I find myself in leading the, the University of Maryland football program. And it's just a way of paying it forward. Um, I know I'm on the back nine of the career uh, in coaching. This will be my 32nd year as a full-time division one coach. And I just thought that it, it was needed to pay it forward to help the next generation of coach Loxley's coming through the pipe. 
there are lots of different ways in which you can help younger coaches, experienced coaches get these opportunities, but none is more important to me than walking it like you talk it. And I'm going to just go through it, coach. You got two black coordinators, right? And Brian Williams and Josh Gaddis, black AD and AD Evans, and a black president in Daryl Pines. I don't think there's another university in this country that can claim that, let alone a black head coach and two black coordinators. How has that helped your culture? And how has that helped you advocate for black coaches in the sport? Yeah, you know, and again, I try to practice what I preach, and that's to hire the best available coaches, the best mm -hmm. possible coaches. You know, a year ago, I had Dan Enos, and I had a chance to work with Dan Enos, who's not, who happens to not be a minority. And so, to me, the opportunity of being able to look and see what's available when it comes to coordinator hirings and is the same way I'd like to see some of these other, you know, especially these NFL owners look at it, is that if there's qualified candidates, uh, black or white, that they have an opportunity. And it just so happened it worked out this way. I can't tell you that I intentionally thought, hey, let's go hire Josh Gaddis, and now I'll have two minority coordinators. I went and hired the best available coach and the best coach I thought that would give us the opportunity to move and continue to move the Maryland program forward. Um, to have the leadership that we have in Dr. Pines, who uh, was the dean of our engineering school here, uh, uh, to, to have a guy like Damon Evans, who spent time leading the Georgia Bulldogs program, um, having those type of uh, bosses to lean on when 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 working through hiring processes has benefited us. And uh, the University of Maryland has benefited from being able to hire some really good coaches like the coordinators we have and, and Brian Williams and Josh Gaddis as well as our special teams coordinator, James Thomas, who's done a, a great job leading our special teams. I'm interested in the hire of Coach Gaddis alongside you added Kevin Sunlin when nobody was looking here a little bit earlier in the spring. Two guys that have a reputation like yourself for prolific offense. And what have those coaching conversations been like with those two guys? Yeah, you know, for me, it's all about getting better and to be able to go out and hire uh people like Kevin Sumlin and his pedigree and the job he did there at Texas A&M and Houston and having Heisman Trophy candidates and working with great quarterbacks and then it's coached in big games. You know, Josh has come up in the business the right way, having spent time, you know, with James Franklin at Vanderbilt and Penn State under Coach Saban there when I was at Alabama and then working with Jim Harbaugh. As I saw our program and the necessary uh, and, and, and it being necessary for us to take that next step I thought the next step was finding a way to uh, maybe improve us as coaches in terms of guys that have been in some of these big games. You know, we played Ohio State, Michigan really close, which, again, close is only good in a game of horseshoes. But I thought that there were some things that we could do now when you hire experienced coaches that have been in some of these big games. You know, obviously the coaching staff that, that helped us build this thing up to where it is today did a really good job of putting down a strong foundation but when I lost coaches, because, again, when you build a program like we have, other people become interested in the coaches in your program. To be able to replace the Dan Enoses, the Mike Millers, the Elijah Brooks with guys like Latrell Scott, who led Richmond to the one uh, AA national championship. Kevin Sumlin, who's been and coached in some of the biggest games you can think of the last 10 years in college football. And even the job Josh has done. You know, prior to the Miami situation, you know, a guy that was well-respected enough that he was named Royals Award winner, which goes out to the nation's top assistant as an assistant there at Michigan. Um, I feel really good that we've upped the experience level, which I'm hopeful uh, will be the next step for our program, is finding ways to win some of these big games. Well, it's an, a really impressive assortment of coaches you got, but also I'm going to point to it, Coach. Gaddis beat Ohio State at Michigan. Uh, Coach Sumlin played at Purdue, right? You right. have guys that, as you mentioned, have played in those big games and have coached in those big games. I'm not going to short Coach Sumlin being my my alma mater. Uh, well, not okay. my grad school alma mater, Oklahoma, when he was doing great things there. But right. you mentioned playing Mich or Michigan and Ohio State close, and you're I understand horseshoes and hand grenades, but you're that close. What is it that you think you need to do in those games specifically to win them? Yeah, it goes down to getting players to execute in critical situations and, um, you know, the way you prepare. Uh, again, both the guys you named, Josh and Kevin, have, have been in some of these dogfights. And, 
Not that the other coaches that I've had hadn't, but I think a clean, fresh perspective of, you know, Kevin having not been in my offensive system, uh, being able to add some elements, you know, when you look and see the things they did at Texas A&M and Houston with the wide open style system. Uh, and then again, Josh's experience of, of being there at Michigan and, and helping them turn that program around and establishing the a physicality in the run game, you know, I think it's a great combination in, in addition to what we've already shown uh, the ability to do on offense, but to add their experience, their game planning throughout the week, uh, you know, a lot of that fell upon just on Dan Enos and, and myself when it came to how we prepared sometimes. I mean, of course, the other coaches were able to to make additions, but to have two guys with experience in the room, when especially when I'm not there, again, I think lends itself that uh, we'll show up and, and put together really good plans this year to, to try to help us take the next step that a bunch of coaches have helped us build on. Well, Coach, I'm going to say it out loud. I'm pulling for you for a number of reasons, but not the least of which is there has not been a black head coach to win a national championship. Willie Taggart went on record 2016 saying he wanted to do it first. We would all like to see anybody do it first, but I'm also going to point to one more instance for which I think the coalition is important. We saw 16 vacancies among FBS head coaches, right? Only one was filled by a black head coach, and that would be Deion Sanders down in Colorado. I wonder, do you see any reflection or do you feel any reserve that you can push forward to try to send goodwill their way or any other black head coaches that you come across? Do you feel some kind of way about seeing Dion and being able to do well at Colorado as you do well at Maryland? You know what? I, I like to see us all do really well and, yeah. and, and be able to be pillars and, and, and set the stage for, for opportunities, as I always talk about, paying it forward for the next generation of, of minority coaches that are coming through the ranks. Uh, we've got to have great success. Um, I, I will say that though there was one hired this cycle at the collegiate level, you look over the last couple of years with guys like Tony Elliott having um, opportunities, Marcus over there at Notre Dame having opportunities, and, and a lot of these guys, uh, Charles Huff at Marshall, a lot of these guys have come through the coalition and the academy uh, that we created uh, where we've taken um, you know, 12 to 14 coaches that we feel – have the stuff and that has been vetted by our organization to where we think they're prepared and ready to lead programs. Um, you see one hire, but I can tell you that the coalition is usually one of the first phone calls made when these job opportunities present themselves, at least in a collegiate level. But what we've got to try to do is figure out this NFL piece because it's mm -hmm. been, um, we've been banging on doors and not getting any answers. And, and there's not a lot of, uh, of buy-in per se by the decision makers at that level where they're calling and, and it's not a college organization. Um, we want to help minority coaches from the rec league coach to the NFL coach that, was, that wants to ascend to the role of leading a program. And to me, uh, we still got a lot of work to do, but I feel really good of the impact that the coalition has had and will continue to have as we keep pushing this thing forward. I'm with you, Coach. I mean, I wrote a column in February about Jalen Hurts and Patrick Mahomes being the first two black quarterbacks to play each other in Super Bowl. And I can think of five black quarterbacks playing a national championship game against each other since 1994, right? I mean, it's when I look at that and as far as the professional ranks versus the college ranks, I'm also asking the question, especially since you're very much keen on what the NFL is doing, do you see the sport of college football getting closer to looking like the NFL? You know what, I, I, I definitely, you see it, and, and as we all find, instead of the trickle down, it's a trickle up effect because the high school systems that were greatly successful in the, the, the early 2000s, mid 2000s to where the spread systems, and now when you look at NFL teams, you see 80% uh, of these teams are running college style systems where before it was the pro style trickling down. Um, and so definitely, I think you see the college game, even in some of the rules that are being applied now, uh, moving and gravitating more toward the way the NFL game is played. And, and, and you definitely, I would hope from a coaching standpoint, if you see the impact that minority quarterbacks have had in the NFL over the last two, three decades to where it, it's, it's a norm, 
um, I'm hopeful that as minority coaches, we can follow that same trend because I think diversity makes it all better. And that doesn't mean diversity in just minorities or black coaches, but diversity in general typically help, helps whatever organization or whatever type of business you're in. And, and I hope that we can follow suit when you look and see the trajectory of what the black quarterback has been able to do um, at the NFL level. And there were times where guys like Charlie Ward and Marvin Graves didn't get those opportunities. They were right there on the edge of that, uh, that, that new transition to the, the minority quarterback. And I'm hopeful that as coaches, we can follow a very similar path. And there's no doubt the college game and the pro game are, are very much parallel to each other. Uh, we got this NIL thing that becomes basically, you know, I'd like to see us go to that salary cap where mm. everybody has the same money to pay a player and we don't have these big gaps between the haves and have nots. And then let's really see what college football is all about when we're playing all with the same type of uh, restrictions or the same type of resources. Well, coach, I'm interested in that aspect of it too, because college football is basically up against the wall when we're talking about NFL. I think of as a, a form of socialism. Worst team gets the first pick, a uh, best team gets the last pick, right? Depending on how much money you spent, you have a cap that you got to hit up against. And let's say the Dallas Cowboys, my team, well, they got money to spend, but there is a salary cap and there is a tax for that. As you see things like that get bounced around in college football, I wonder if you come across a system of player that or a system of paying that you find that doesn't really get under your skin as much, because that's what we're really talking about is tradition, right? right. Traditionally, this is an amateur sport. Traditionally, right. this is a sport for which you're trying to get an education. Now it feels like you're going to get the education, but you should also get paid to play football. Yeah. And the money that's involved and I'm part of a league that's, I think at the forefront of college football in the big 10, the best of both worlds where you have strong academic institutions where the academic piece is really important to our league and making sure that the resources aren't just put into the athletic part of it, but also into the educational component of what being a student athlete should be about. But to me, I think where the problem lies with college football, there's a reason why a team like Cincinnati can go to back-to-back -to -back championship games, and they're one of the smaller markets in the NFL, probably one of the ones that have spent the least resources. But – they're getting the same exact resources. They have the same opportunities of some of the bigger markets because of the alignment of being in a league. I think to me, if you continue to study the way college football is going to go, as the, the, the people that have been able to raise money the most are the guys that have opportunities to win championships and you know the fan bases that are putting up the money to say, hey, we want great players. Uh, we've seen the benefits of it uh, through this NIL thing that's out now where teams – you know, have really made big jumps and big strides before the guardrails, which I think are eventually going to come, show up. And so to me, you know, we signed a billion dollar TV deal in the Big Ten. Uh, let's take 25 million out of that and give it to every school and say, that's your salary cap. Mm -hmm. That's what you recruit with. That's how you you manage it, how you see fit, which is very similar to what the NFL does with their salary caps. And then I think you'll start to see a little more parity uh, in, in terms of the way college football kind of plays itself out as the as the season goes on. I'm curious to see how that particular aspect gets picked up because I'm with you. I like that idea. You also mentioned the strength of the Big Ten. Uh, I've said for the last couple of months now, we're in a, uh, a time when there are two power leagues, right? The SEC and the Big Ten. And I believe the reason for that is the Big Ten got stronger with the addition of of USC and UCLA coming in 2024. How are you expecting to try to overcome the travel that is going to be involved with going to LA or Pasadena and or adding extra games? And not for nothing, those football teams of recent have been pretty doggone good. How are you feeling about the challenge of playing Big Ten football, not just in 23, but 24-25? Yeah, we're here now uh, mindset, but there's no doubt we know that they're coming. And uh, two really good programs that I think add a tremendous value to our league, which is evident in type, the type of deal that Kevin Warren, our former commissioner, was able to uh, execute before leaving to go join Chicago. And so I embrace it. Uh, you know, 2014, we were one of those programs. Us and Rutgers were in the same position. 
Um, I think the value of bringing the LA TV market to the Big Ten, like we did with the DC market and Rutgers with the New York market, is what makes our league uh, the best in, in the country. Uh, I think the the educational value that they both add uh, continues along the line of the best of both worlds that the Big Ten does offer. Um, the travel things; these are all things that uh, we're in the process of studying. You know, I have our football ops person, Andy Papard, who's kind of doing a project on studying the way the NFL teams that travel out West, do we leave on a Thursday instead of leaving on a Friday uh, to get out there and the acclimation period. And I think the big 10 is working through some of these kinks to ensure that the travel stuff that comes into play with going across country uh, doesn't add a competitive advantage or disadvantage. And, and I got a lot of faith in uh, the way the big 10 does things. Cause we've always been at the forefront and, uh, big thinkers anyway. So I don't think that'll have as much uh, issues from a football standpoint. Now I'm selfish because I'm just thinking football, but you know, obviously they've got to work through the basketball and the non-revenue sports, the Olympic sports that, you know, do have to make these travel adjustments and, and may not have, it's not a once a week deal, but two, three times a week. So again, um, I think the addition of both UCLA, USC has been a, a great thing for the Big Ten, and I know we're excited all here at Maryland to compete against those type of programs. Yeah, I'm curious as to how the Olympic sports are going to do this too, because some of those are in conferences that people don't even know they're in. I believe like Colorado right. women's golf is in the Big Ten, for instance, right? So I, right. I'm interested to see how those things play out as well, Coach. Um, in as far as your team, so I want to I want to focus in here just a second. You have been loud for at least two years now, about the kind of player that Talia Tonga-Valoa is, right? Took time at the lectern at the Big Ten uh, media days last year to tell everybody, hey, I got one of the best quarterbacks in the sport. What is it going to take for other folks to recognize that? And I was going to look at your claim here, and my goodness, this dude's got a bunch of records at Maryland. Now, forgive the implication here, but I'm going to put the question to you. You pick it up. Are we going to watch Talia take the leap to Heisman contender in 23? I can tell you this. I, I'm a believer of him. Mm -hmm. And I know having been around um, three guys that have been, uh, had the opportunity to be in the Heisman contention, um, having been a part of Mac Jones, Jalen Hurts, and, and Tua, Tonga Vailoa's uh, run, that he has the stuff. And, you know, what we, we need to do a better job around him um, I've got to do a better job of continuing to develop him in all the areas necessary. But, you know, when you look at the records he's broken here at Maryland, I mean, he, he's talking, you're talking about a guy that's breaking records, the guys like Boomer Esaias and uh, Neil O'Donnell, it's all these former NFL, Scott Zolak, who played here and played in the league uh, that had great success over the years. Uh, these are some longstanding records and, you know, the guy has shown up and every year uh, has helped us and he, and nobody has played a bigger role in my opinion of us, our trajectory than what the quarterback position has done here the last three seasons he's led us. And so to have him back for year four, at least right now, you know, this portal window goes till next week. So uh, you never, ever know. So I don't speak in, uh, in def definites here, but, as long as he shows up here and leads uh, leads the Maryland program, I think we'll have a chance to take another step, and it'll be because of the type of play he offers us as our quarterback. Well, you won back-to-back -back bowl games, right? And that's not anything to sneeze at, especially sure. with the kind of history that Maryland has had in recent years. But I'm going to ask, Coach, what is your bar for success in 23? Well, to, to, be, to be better than a year ago. And to me, that's not always – shown in the win or loss column it's it's shown in the type of program you have it's shown the way we compete it's shown the way that our players are being developed i mean you look and see that we have seven guys invited to the combine this year which i don't ever think we've ever had this many guys and you know you have 31 of the 32 nfl teams show up here for our pro day um i think it speaks volumes to the way that we develop players in our program but also you know, I think we played last season with 22 graduates, you know, guys that are wearing the graduate patches. So uh, these guys are earning degrees. They're being developed for the next level. And I mean, that's what it's all about when you choose a school. I think obviously NIL uh, it plays a major role. And, you know, we're in one of the better markets 
being located in between two major cities in D.C. and Baltimore, that it's something that we should be able to take full advantage of and, and, and get in the mix to start uh, being compete, competing to play for championships and not just bowl eligibility. You are in a very cool place uh, for recruiting and for NIL. Like it's one of these things where when it pops off, everybody's going to notice, right? But yeah. I watched Roman Hemby pop off last year. I didn't expect Roman Hemby to be that dude. I'm still kind of sore at you, coach, because you could have got him like 11 yards, get him to 1,000 yards, but we're going to let that go. How has he been able to help you, not just last year, but going into this spring, knowing what you got at tailback? Yeah, you know, a year ago, everybody was concerned. You know, you talked and heard a lot about the receiver room, which was uh, very much warranted in that we had guys like Rockham Jarrett, uh, Deontay Banks, uh, not Deontay, Dante Demas, mm -hmm. and then Jacob Copeland, you know, all coming to play receiver in a system that has shown to be really good for receivers. And I can remember telling people that will listen, the young running back room is really talented and we've done a good, really good job of developing. So nobody here was really surprised by what everybody else saw um, in Roman Hemby. Um, and, and like you said, I mean, he's a guy that is smart, tough, reliable, the three things we look for. And uh, we've got some other young running backs, you saw signs of Antoine Littleton and his ability. Kobe McDonald, who a year ago was the number two guy, while we redshirted both Roman and, and, and Antoine. So, you know, and then we haven't even thrown in the true freshman, Ramon Brown, who showed up here a year ago and now looks to be really a, a, a guy that will have an opportunity to develop into a guy that plays at the next level. So happy with the way that running back room has, has come along and, and definitely a guy like Roman – kind of sets the bar for what our culture is like. Mike Loxley will lead the red and white scrimmage this Saturday for Maryland, finishing out what we hope to be a really outstanding spring for the Maryland Terrapins. Coach, I'm looking forward to seeing what y'all do in Big Ten competition come the fall. Thank you so much, Coach Loxley, for joining the show. Thanks, RJ. Appreciate you, bro. My thanks again to Coach Loxley for taking time to speak with us here on the number one college football show. I am pulling for Coach Locks, and I can't wait to see what his Terrapins look like come September. All right, that is going to do it for this episode of the number one college football show. My thanks as always to our lead producer, Tyler Wojak, our senior producers, Catherine Donnelly. Our director is Kyle Holly. Our social media maven is Javion Duncan. Our lead of screening is Jack Coakley, and our production assistant is Kiara Santana. I'm the host, RJ. We will see y'all on Friday. Deuces.